Welcome to A Well Cared For Human, the podcast that tries to convince you that you are 100% normal and an even better than okay example of the human species, despite the fact that sometimes we feel like the craziest, most incapable, or worthless creatures on the face of this planet. I'm Corey, an author, a creative, and the host of the show. Whatever you're bringing to the table today, I hope this episode proves to be a dose of inspiration for you on your quest to become a well-cared-for human. You can find the episode show notes, your free wellness blueprint, and more at awellcaredforhuman.com. And as always, thank you for listening. Hello, humans. It's your host, Corey, and today we're going to talk about habits, but probably not the habits you're thinking of. Instead, I want to talk about the six transformative habits that I like to use, that I have used to completely transform my life. And when we talk about habits, this is a very popular topic. (laughs) If you were to go into any bookstore, I'm sure that you would find a thousand books on the shelves talking about how to make good habits, how to break bad habits. And that's because we are somewhat obsessed with this idea of habits in our current culture. So anytime that we're talking about a routine behavior, something that we do over and over again, sometimes so much to the fact that it's automatic that we do it without thinking, we're talking about habits. So if there's something that you do in your life regularly, almost reflexively, you can do it without thinking, then that is probably a habit that you have. Now, habits can be both positive, like exercising every day or eating well or going to bed at a certain time, or they can be negative, like biting your nails or procrastinating. Those are my two favorite bad habits. (laughs) I've gotten better about biting my nails. It was really bad when I was a teenager. So when I was a teenager, I would bite my nails so badly that they'd be like down to the quicks. It was very terrible. It was clearly a sign of my anxiety at the time. Now I don't really bite my nails, but I'll catch myself every once in a while going to put my fingers in my mouth. And I'm just like, oh, don't do that. And so I can stop myself now, but it used to be a really bad habit of mine and definitely procrastinating. I still have that one. (laughs) I haven't broken that one. I will catch myself procrastinating, especially when I feel overwhelmed by something or if I like there's so much going on. I'm like, nope, I'm just gonna avoid that for a little bit longer. And so they can be bad or they can be good habits. That part is less important. It's more this connection to repetition until they become mindless, so to speak. It's just something that you do without thinking. So the habits that I would love to encourage you to develop to such an extent that they are just automatic are awareness, courage, optimism, trust, saying no, and gratitude. Now, we probably don't think of awareness, courage, optimism, trust, saying no, and gratitude as habits, but they absolutely can be. We can develop the tendency to react to our situations with awareness. We can develop the tendency to react to fear with courage. We can develop the tendency to be optimistic when things are getting difficult. We can develop the automatic response of trusting ourselves and trusting our ability to pull through something rather than becoming more fearful. We can develop the habit of saying no when we need to say no, which is really hard for those of us who are reformed people pleasers. (laughs) Developing the habit of saying no when you need to say no, that's challenging for sure. And then again, having the habit of being grateful even in challenging circumstances. And so before I talk about how we can turn these into habits, because you've probably never heard anyone say courage is a habit. If you have, absolutely tell me who that person is because I want to go read more of their stuff. (laughs) But usually we think of habits as some of the things I mentioned before, like the procrastination or the nail biting or the eating well or the exercising. We don't think of these mental tricks, I guess we could call them, as habitual, that they can become habitual. So before I break those down and talk about how we can turn them into habits, I also want to look at what the opposite is. So The bad, so to speak, you know, I'm using air quotes around bad because what does bad even mean? The bad habit associated with each of these so that we could talk about why maybe you developed the quote bad habit in the first place. So the opposite of awareness is either denial or shutting down or ignoring or turning away from something. So it's that lack of awareness. And there's a lot of reasons why we develop that. So in my case, I was so tuned into my survival instinct that I was basically moving from one crisis to the next. And so as a child, it was just nonstop something terrible happening. Someone's in jail or now someone's beat up or now someone is missing or now someone is, you know, it was just crisis after crisis after crisis. And so it developed this habit of mine to act before thinking. There was no time to think. We could not 
stop and think about this. We had to do something because we were always in crisis mode, me and my family. And so my habit became action rather than awareness because awareness requires that we take a moment that we stop and we pause and we think about what's going on. But it's impossible to do that if you're in crisis mode. It's not really impossible, but it feels that way. And so learning how to build that space, even in a crisis moment where your instinct is to say, okay, wait, let me think about this. Let me think about the best way to move forward here. Removing that urgency, removing that pressure that takes practice. And hopefully we will not all be enduring so many crisis moments (laughs) that we have to practice it in that way. But we can practice awareness in a more natural state. So the things I've recommended before, like meditation or mindfulness practices, that's how we practice awareness, not in crisis mode. But if we've only come from situations where it was crisis after crisis after crisis, the habit that you're looking to replace is that sense of urgency, that sense of acting before you have a moment to think about it. And so we can shift from one space to the other. In the case of courage, if you came from a situation where terrible thing happened after terrible thing after terrible thing, then your normal default reaction is probably fear. It's very natural to feel fear when bad things come up because we don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know what's going to happen. In our case, if we've had a lot of experience with the negative outcome, like the worst thing that could happen is what happened, then we have a tendency to experience fear about what might be coming next. And so the opposite of that being courage, like how do we develop the tendency to not react to a challenge with fear, but to react to a challenge with courage, that's something that has to be practiced. We have to continuously step into that courage space in order to make sure that that's what we do instinctively, that what we instinctively reach for is our courage. And for me, the first step to courage or the precursor to courage is curiosity. And so I've talked a bit about that in different episodes, this idea of getting curious about what I think might happen rather than just assuming I know what's going to happen. So let's say a situation triggers me and it could go wrong or something could go bad. Instead of saying, oh, well, here's the absolute worst thing that's going to happen, immediately catastrophizing, immediately expecting the worst, just kind of get curious. Like, well, how is it going to shake out? Like, maybe it's not going to do what it did last time. Maybe it's going to do something different. So even just shifting my perspective in that way helps to alleviate the tension of the situation. And we don't, again, just like awareness, we don't need traumatic experiences <laughs> or difficult circumstances to practice courage. You can find little baby challenges in your world, just things that scare you just a little bit and just be brave enough to try them. Like maybe that, I don't know, daring physical activity you've ever wanted to do, like skiing or something. I don't know who would want to take two sticks and strap them to their feet and slide down a steep icy hill, but I hear that it's fun <laughs> for someone. <laughs> But if that scares you, you know, just doing a little thing that you can practice courage or maybe you want to go to a new restaurant, but you hate going new places by yourself. You get really nervous about going and eating by yourself or going to different parts of the city that you live in that you've never been to before. So just baby steps of courage in a sense that's very approachable, not courage because the world is falling apart and now you have to be brave. That's a wonderful time to discover that you're brave, but maybe something a little bit easier to work with before that. And then same for optimism. So optimism, and I've talked a lot about negativity. In fact, I think I just did an episode a few weeks back about working with negativity. So there's a lot to be said about optimism there. But optimism is also a habit. So if you have someone in your life who's a really pessimistic person... Like they just view the world really pessimistically. They think everything is terrible all the time. That's probably habitual. That person has probably been so chronically disappointed by their circumstances or the people around them that they just have a really pessimistic view. And I was definitely that person for a while where I had been disappointed so many times by the people that I loved that it was just really hard for me to hope for the best or expect the best. And so I had to develop a habit of optimism in order to combat that, to overcome that. And then trust, having the habit of trust rather than having the habit of distrust. So if it's your habit to try something and you're like, oh my God, I'm never going to pull this off. Like this is not going to work. In a hundred years, this is not going to work out for me. That's you distrusting yourself. And that distrust of yourself can be habitual. So if you do it enough times, that will be the thing that you reach for instinctively in a new or challenging situation. But you can instead condition yourself to trust yourself so that when something comes up and it triggers that fear and you're like, oh gosh, I don't know if I can do this, immediately start jumping into this, 
oh, yes, I can. Absolutely, I'm going to do it and build yourself up. That could be your habitual response instead of this negative version of it. And then saying no. So, of course, we know that saying no is challenging for those of us who don't come from environments where we're allowed to say no. (laughs) Or maybe we just want to be really nice and we don't want to say no. And so it becomes habitual to say yes, even though we know we should not say yes to things. And so we go to a party or something and someone asks us to do something or we meet up with a friend and they ask us to do something and we know we should say no and we really want to say no, but the pressure to say yes is just so intense. Well, that pressure is coming from your conditioning, from your habitual use of yes rather than your habitual use of no, I can't do that, I'm really sorry. And we can counteract that by practicing saying no. And again, looking for those low stakes easy, non-threatening opportunities to say no just until we get the hang of it. And believe it or not, gratitude is also a habit. But I fully get why some of us cannot be grateful for things. (laughs) I'm remembering very clearly when I was about 15 years old and it was the Thanksgiving holiday, you know, the holiday of gratitude. And all of my friends were really excited to go home for the long weekend, you know, four days off school, no work. You get to see your cousin that you only see once a year. You get to eat all the things that you want to eat. And they were just so excited for that experience. I was not. I was having a really hard time because what I needed to do was to go down to the jailhouse and meet with my mother because we had visitation rights, I guess we could say, for the holiday. You could come and see your person, whoever was in jail, for whatever the allotted time is. I don't remember how long the allotted time was, if it was 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. I don't know. But that's what I had to look forward to, was not eating all these delicious foods or seeing people that I wanted to see, even though, of course, I did want to see my mother. It was I needed to go down to this jailhouse and meet with her and sit on this little rickety metal stool and talk to her through this plexiglass situation and see how sad she was, but she was trying to keep on a strong front for me. And so it was just a terrible experience. And so I would look at my situation and then I would look at everyone else's situation and I just did not feel grateful. It didn't feel like I had a lot to be grateful for. And of course that wasn't true. Of course there were still things I could be grateful for in my life, but it's very hard to practice gratitude when you feel like your circumstances are really difficult. And so I had to train myself to be grateful even when things were hard. And again, hopefully we're not going to be building these habits in the worst conditions. (laughs) I'm not saying that I want you to build awareness and courage and optimism and trust and saying no and gratitude when things are terrible. I'm saying that you can start practicing them now when things are hopefully not quite so hard. I mean, maybe you are dealing with something difficult and it's hard to practice these things but my point is is that you can build them when things are terrible or you can build them when things are good in either case it just takes that repetition we can look at these transformative practices as habits because that's exactly what they are they're habits and so how do we build habits well first we identify the habit clearly define the habit that we want to build get specific about what we want to achieve so in the case of awareness i'm telling myself i want to achieve that sense of peace that sense of calm in urgent situations or in challenging situations. I want to be able to step back and look at it calmly and clearly before I make my decision. I don't want to feel pressed. So that's my goal and that's my habit identification. And then I want to start really small. Like again, don't go to level 10 right off the bat. You want to start with something really manageable. For me, that would be like a five minute meditation. That's an entry point to practicing awareness. I'm just practicing stopping what I'm doing and looking around or any kind of five minute mindfulness practice that I could do every day. But the repetition is the important part, doing it again and again and again. And then when you get into a situation and you catch yourself not being aware, you're like, oh, well, you just recommit to challenging it again, to doing it again over and over until it becomes so well rehearsed that that's what your mind goes to. And it does help to have goals. So for example, if you're like, I want to start with one minute meditations a day, I want to work up to five, that's my next goal. 10 minutes is my next goal. Read a mindfulness book and do one of those exercises every day for a month. You can break this down however you want to, to give you a sense of progress, like how you're progressing in this sense. And it's not just for awareness. So for courage, I'm going to do one month mildly scary thing a day (laughs) or it's going to be my goal to do one scary thing a week or I'm going to make that phone call that I've been avoiding making. I didn't want to call the doctor because it's freaking me out but I'm going to make that phone call. So looking for little opportunities to practice courage and then putting it in your book. So for me I have a to-do list and if it's not on the to-do list I have a tendency to ignore it or forget that it needs to be done. So I actually have to put things on a list to do that keeps me organized. Whatever your 
organization technique is. So put it on the list or get it down on paper or give yourself a specific deadline so that you can keep moving forward. Same for trust. So trust is more situational in the sense that we typically don't need to use trust all of the time, but we can still find low risk situations to practice trust. So let's say delegation. Delegation is a really hard one for a lot of us. If you are a high achieving person who likes to get 5,000 things done in a day, you're going to find it really challenging to give someone else a task and trust that they do it. (laughs) without coming in and be like, oh my God, (laughs) you know? So there are low stake situations where you can practice trust. For me, giving a task to someone else, delegating something to someone else and then taking hands off, just letting them handle it, letting them do it however they want to do it as long as it gets done, that requires trust. And so that's a very low stakes way for me to practice trust. Nothing is actually hanging in the balance to do that. Maybe it was like take out the trash and then just don't ask about it 10 times. (laughs) I don't know why I use the trash example. I'm the person who takes out the trash in the house, but whatever it is for you, insert low-risk chore, insert low-risk repair job or task so you can practice it in this way. Saying no, just telling yourself, the next time someone asks me to do something that I can't do, I'm absolutely going to say no. Or consequently, look for something in your life that you should already be saying no to, like something you should stop doing because you don't have the time or energy and investment in it. And then practice courage and call up that person and be like, hi, I would like to relinquish my role as insert thing you should have never said yes to in the first place. (laughs) I just can't do this anymore. And practice your script of what you're going to say when they're like, oh, no, why? Because sometimes people try to coerce us into staying, right? Because they want us to keep doing the thing that's best for them. But this is your chance to practice no. And all of these don't have high risk scenarios. So I guess what I'm just trying to really drill in here is that yes, a lot of the times we develop mistrust and negativity and fear as a reaction to difficult circumstances, terrible situations, but we can build their counterparts, awareness, courage, optimism, trust, boundaries, which is saying no, gratitude. We can do that even in low stakes or positive ways. We don't need another crisis to help us practice those things. But of course, We'd want to do it in such a capacity that when the crisis comes up or when the terrible thing happens, we've worked so much with awareness or we've worked so much with courage or we've worked so much with optimism that that's the instinctual thing to do. That's what we reach for immediately because we've been practicing with it over and over again in these low stakes ways. If it helps you to be really structured about it. Habits are usually connected to repetition, so it's about doing the thing over and over again. But some people do better with specific routines, like they have a specific time and a place where they're going to do this thing. Consistency is a part of habit formation. So that's kind of why I like something like the meditation, where it's like, When I wake up in the morning, first thing I'm going to do is meditate for five minutes. That consistency also makes it easier to do it habitually until it becomes the thing that you do no matter what. I also, just like other habits, I like to use triggers or cues to get me to do the new thing. So just like if we wanted to exercise more, we would put that exercise with a specific habit that we're already doing in the day. So for example, if you always eat lunch at 1 p.m., I don't know why you would exercise after lunch, but stay with me. (laughs) could have thought my example through a little bit more. But let's say you always eat lunch at 1, and so you always decide that at 1.30 when you're done with lunch, you're going to go down to the gym for an hour. It becomes habitual, this idea of lunch, gym, lunch, gym. Like, you start to view them together. That's how I train myself to floss, actually. Flossing is not awareness, courage, optimism, or trust, or boundaries, or gratitude. <laughs> but I did teach myself to floss with this triggers method in the sense that every time I did this, I would also do this. So Instead of telling myself, oh, I'm just going to floss once a day, I was like, every time I brush my teeth, I'm just going to floss. Like, I'm just going to put them together. And so I did that because brushing was already part of, like, my morning teen with my skincare and everything. And so it was like, I just needed to add that thing. And so now it's a non-negotiable and it's just as habitual. I will pick up the floss without thinking about it. And that's what we want. We want it to be the thing that we do no matter what. And so if you can find some triggers or some situations in your life that you can pair with courage or optimism and awareness so that when the situation happens, that's your instinct. You just go to it and do it immediately. Consistency is really the key. Habits form because we do them over and over again. It's the repetition. And so if you are living in such a way now that makes it hard for you to be consistent in these ways, just look at little ways that you can make those changes. What's the level one tiny, tiny task you could do to practice awareness today or the tiny, tiny task you could do to practice courage and start there. Don't try to advance too quickly. That's not the important part. The important part is the repetition. 
So you'll get there faster if you can just do it over and over again. And not every strategy works for everybody. Of course, this is going to be different for everyone. So if you know yourself well and you know how you work and you know what things that you'll do that you'll respond well to, just use that. Use that system and then find a way to maybe reward yourself. That would require that you track your progress a bit because like how do you know if you're making progress in which to reward yourself for? (laughs) So maybe you could journal about it or maybe you could have, again, like that to-do list or that sheet that shows the progress that you're making maybe you have a little calendar when I was little and I did something good I got a little star on a calendar in my bedroom and so when I got so many stars I got a treat you know I know that this sounds like treating yourself like a child (laughs) but maybe you respond well to that to some kind of reward system and so giving yourself an excuse to celebrate your wins to celebrate your victories to celebrate your milestones that you're becoming a more aware person a more courageous person a more optimistic person a person with better boundaries a person who's more grateful celebrate that it will be a reward in and of itself that you develop those things just because you will find that you have a lot more peace in your mind You have a lot more stability in your days and a lot more, I think of it as space, (laughs) emotional space. So there will be rewards in and of itself when these become your habits, but also just treating yourself along the way and being like, this is challenging work, but I'm doing it and I'm really proud of myself for doing it. Above all, definitely practice patience because like with any habits, it takes time to build them. It takes time to break, quote, bad habits. So if right now you are a very fearful person, it's going to take time for you to become brave in the face of your fears for that to be your instinct for that to be the thing that you reach for immediately is your courage and not your pessimism or not your mistrust so just be really patient with yourself as you take the time to build up these habits and you put in these efforts just stay patient stay persistent and don't get discouraged by your setbacks we all stumble from time to time i am in my 40s now i am 20 plus years away from high school but again sometimes i catch myself you know putting my finger in my mouth and I'm like ah don't do it and so we just have to be very loving with ourselves and kind with ourselves even if we find that we backslide in some way it doesn't mean that all is lost and it doesn't mean that your hard work wasn't worth it it just is something that happens it happens to the best of us but the main takeaway that I want you to absorb today is that if you have a habit of negativity or mistrust or fear these are perfectly normal reactions to difficult circumstances that kept repeating themselves over and over in your life and you developed that habit in order to protect yourself in order to take care of yourself but you also have the ability to break those habits that you can shift from this mode of surviving to thriving because that's what I did and if I can do it absolutely that means you can do it too and that's it for today dear human as always I hope you found this episode useful and if you would like to write into the show today and ask me for my thoughts on something that you're dealing with I would love to hear from you through any of my social media or through email cory at coryimsham.com Otherwise, I will be back next week with another episode of A Well-Cared-For Human, and until then, please take good care of you. This episode of A Well-Cared-For Human was written and produced by me, Cory Marie. The music was by Late Night Feeler and Esther Abrami. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider visiting my Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you get early ad-free access to the episodes, as well as a monthly patrons-only Q&A, bonus videos, and more. Not to mention that your Patreon support lets me know that you find value in the show and want it to continue. You can find me on Patreon by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Corey Marie. If you can't support the show financially, that is okay. You can still subscribe to the show, leave a review of the show, and recommend the show to your friends, not just the neurotic ones. All of this helps so much. And as always, thank you for listening.